ten bucks to the slips. What do you want to talk about on gear tasting today? Well, I was going to talk about a new messenger bag colorway, but now, since it's raining, I'm going to talk about rain gear. Why? Right, what are you doing? Uh, I just lost a bet. About what? Nothing. Welcome to Gear Tasting. Today I wanted to talk about rain gear. It is raining outside and I thought it'd be a great time to kind of highlight some pros and cons of some certain rain gear I like and what I don't, as well as talk a little bit about how Gore-Tex works and how it's great in certain situations and how personally I think it sucks in others. So first off, when I typically deal with rain gear on a daily basis when I'm not specifically going hiking or camping or an event where I'm going to be outdoors for an extended period of time. I typically don't have any of this stuff I'm going to talk about with me. I typically have some some rain gear which is a, which are a version of the frog togs I'll talk about in a second. Um, I have those in my vehicle that I can grab if need be in a pinch if I have to be outside changing a flat tire or something like that. So I do have that kind of stuff with me but it's, it's a little bit outside the scope of what we're going to talk about today. Today is more going to be the rain gear for when you're out in the environment uh, and you've packed these kind of things with you. So uh, specifically we're going to talk about hard shell jackets. So I refer to this as kind of the, uh, the rain layer, so to speak, uh, but it's like level six if you're dealing with a PCU system. So we did a pretty extensive article on the protective combat uniform on ITS. Uh, very thorough article, so if you're interested in learning more about that, I will reference that in the show notes today on the video so you can check that out. But basically this is the level six uh, from the most current, well, so block one from the PCU system. And you'll kind of understand block zero, block one, block two when you actually read the article on PCU if you guys haven't yet. But so this is the block one PCU. Patagonia did a lot of military contract work uh, for the government when they developed the protective combat uniform. And this level six is the rain gear layer. Um, and this is the hard shell. It's got Gore-Tex in it, as you can see the little Gore-Tex label that's hanging in there. Um, the way you can tell the difference between a dedicated rain layer uh, and a hard shell versus something that's not, like this level four, they both go swish swish. The only way you can really tell them apart is one's a little bit thicker material and it has taped seams. So on the inside, the seams that are actually in there are taped and that's we talked about that in the last gear tasting radio too, is how tents have tape seams. So if you look at all these different jackets here, so this one's from Patagonia, this is from Arteryx, but they all have tape seams. Some companies do that a little more cleanly than others. I personally love Arteryx's tape seams. Uh, they're a little more uh, robust and, and easy to, uh, they're smaller basically and I think they talked about that in a presentation and I can't remember their technology behind it but that's gonna that's gonna be the big set apart from your jackets that are water are truly waterproof and are not so the way that Gore-Tex works if for those of you that guys that don't know at home Gore-Tex does not allow water in its liquid form to enter or permeate the fabric. So a water droplet on the top of Gore-Tex will not go through. So that's how Gore-Tex works. However, it allows water in its vapor form or liquid water in vapor form to exit the material. So the sweat and perspiration that you have underneath a garment like this allows, the Gore-Tex fabric allows that to escape. So provided your base layers that are underneath the hard shell like this also are synthetic base layers that allow your, uh, your water vapor to escape that system, it eventually pushes its way into your outer layer and then out the system through Gore-Tex. That's why this is the most outer layer. And even though the PCU is a seven layer system, it's not something where you put on all seven layers and then expect to, to exist out in the elements. You really have to tailor that to the kind of environment in and the kind of temperature you're in. Is it raining? Is it not raining? Those are all variables that go into selection, but we're really talking today specifically about rain gear. So I might have something like this. This is a, a Patagonia piece that um, I cannot remember the name of, obviously, 
but it's basically a synthetic layer that is going to allow water vapor to escape as well. So provided I wasn't wearing a crappy cotton shirt under this, which is kind of the, uh, the metaphor in the camping world, cotton's rotten, so you should avoid it, especially in socks. Never wear cotton socks if you're out in the elements. Never wear cotton socks, period. I've replaced all my cotton socks with, with uh, wool socks, and I would highly recommend you do the same. But if, if you're out there in the elements and water vapor is allowed to escape the system, it is eventually going to push its way through the Gore-Tex and not allow rain in. So that's how that works. Now, when you get into footwear that has Gore-Tex, this is where I hate Gore-Tex. I can't stand Gore-Tex in footwear because, you know, what creates a blister? So you've got moisture, you've got heat, and you've got friction, and that's how, that's a recipe for blisters, right? So, yes, is Gore-Tex, and these boots are really old. They're some old La Sportiva boots that I have, but they have Gore-Tex in them, and I'm just using them for an example. They're not really comparable to the, um, the other boots I have here from Loa. But when... Gore-Tex is used in footwear, yes it does allow that to escape, but I have felt that it doesn't allow it to escape any easier than like a, a leather lined boot. So these are, uh, these are Loa Renegades and they're leather lined. So these are my absolute favorite boots in the world. Uh, I wear these things everywhere and I can't say enough good things about them. I will probably continue to buy them until I die or they stop making them. So um, I've really I've really never found a better boot. This is my second pair and I've had these forever. I've climbed 14ers with them. I've done the Mammoth Sniper Challenge with them. There's nothing that I've thrown at these boots that they can't handle. However, there is a limitation of these boots and that's water that's going through rain. And the thing about that is, is that Gore-Tex is, is a synthetic material. So you're still gonna be dealing with water being held in the boot. So Gore-Tex is not going to automatically make your feet waterproof and that's kind of where the misconception comes in when you're talking about Gore-Tex footwear. People think, oh I'm just going to buy Gore-Tex footwear and my feet will be waterproof, it'd be no big deal. Well that's actually false because yes while vapor is allowed to exit through the Gore-Tex material, that heat is still inside the boot so heat and friction are still there and there's still moisture even though that water vapor is exiting through the boot and yes, you could say that it's doing it better in a Gore-Tex boot than another boot, it's still inside the boot and you're still gonna get blisters and the best way to manage that is to change your socks frequently and treat your feet the right way and to cover up hot spots with something like Luco tape when you get them and ensure you've got some alcohol pads to clean the surface of your foot before you apply the Luco tape or the Luco tape's just gonna fall off. So there's things that you can do to treat blisters the right way and there's things you can do wrong, which is completely and solely rely on Gore-Tex footwear to not cause blisters and keep your feet dry, because it's not going to happen. I mean, you know, when you're talking about pants that, that cover boots, you know, the minute you step in a puddle of water, or the minute your, your feet become compromised up over where Gore-Tex is located, you're still going to be dealing with the same situation that you would in a different boot. So that's why I like the leather line boots, because they are more comfortable season round for me. I would rather deal with being worried about getting into water with these than I would having the false sense of security with Gore-Tex, if that kind of makes sense. So that's kind of how I, how I look at it. So there's a couple of products that you can use if you are going to go with a leather line boot. And so Arteryx used to make a thing called the Matic Dry Socks, and it's a running joke on gear tasting that I can't stop talking about these, even though they don't make them anymore. Um, this is essentially just a big Gore-Tex booty. So what's great about these is that, yes, the, the vapor is allowed to escape from this, but now you're not dealing with the friction that's created in the boot and your sock. So um, you still have friction, but there's another layer that's rubbing between the boot and your sock and your foot. So you're kind of helping yourself out with that. Is this, this is not foolproof either, don't get me wrong. This is not going to be the be-all, end-all solution. I'm not saying this plus leather lined is going to be going to cure the waterproof situation. I'm just saying this is an option to completely keep your feet dry. So as you can see, these go well up the leg and even water coming in from the top of the boot, you know, it would have to, it would have to enter your pants and then come all the way up, you know, probably mid calf range. So these will protect your feet a lot better and not allow water in. You're still going to be dealing with wet boots in either situation, whether they're Gore-Tex or leather line, but at least you've got some kind of protection with your feet. Um, there were these things called, uh, that Integral Designs made, excuse me, called hot socks or vapor barrier socks. 
sometimes referred to as hot sex too. But they were, you know, basically they were a synthetic material that was not made out of Gore-Tex. So what this would do was really just lock in all the moisture and heat from your feet and not allow anything to escape. So it's almost like, you know, putting, that's why they're called hot socks, nothing would escape. So moisture, water vapor doesn't escape, heat doesn't escape. There's not a lot that these are good for other than uh, a quick walk across a pond or something like that to protect your feet in the event of a water crossing. So that's where they'd come into play. But the problem with that is if you are going to have a water crossing in boots, your boots get wet, your socks don't, well, you got to allow your boots to dry out or change into something. So there's always problems with that too. So if you can take your boots off during a water crossing and your socks, I'd highly recommend that. Um, however, that leaves your feet susceptible too. So it's really not a foolproof plan uh, on either front. So those are some options. Um, and I kind of on the sock side, I've found these darn tough uh, hike trek socks lately. This is a little package that they came in whenever I bought them. I don't know if they've changed the packaging, but um, these things are really good. I wore these during the last uh, Mammoth Sniper Challenge and I really liked them uh, because they're a thin wool sock too. I really like how thin they are. Um, they, they seem to work really well and you know I maintain my feet just fine. I never got any blisters during Mammoth because I you know I maintain my feet. So when I felt hot spots um, I would change them as soon as possible. I couldn't always just pull right over and do it, um, but I feel like I stayed on top of them enough um, to allow my feet to dry out and not cause blisters. So, um, And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is just the frog tog stuff. So this is kind of the lightweight stuff I carry with me wherever I go, even if there's no rain in the forecast. So this is like nine ounces. It's super lightweight. I usually have it in a little Ziploc or a waterproof bag, um, but this is just a, these are pants and a shirt that I can throw on in a pinch and have a little waterproof layer if I need it, if I've got to get out to change a tire or something. So I've got a little bit bulkier set of frog togs that are a little less susceptible to ripping and damage as these are, because this is a pretty thin material. Um, but that's what I have in my truck just for, you know, that certain circumstance when I have to get out and change a tire or something. So hopefully that provides a little bit of information on Gore-Tex and just some options for rain gear. Um, this is the Arterix Alpha LT. I don't know if I mentioned that. Again, PCU level six, which is made by Patagonia. You can sometimes find those used on eBay. Um, this is also the level four from the PCU system too. And again, this is a wind shirt. It's not going to prevent water from coming in. So, rain gear. Welcome to Questions Over Coffee. First off, we're on our second prototype of our uh, new gear tasting mug. You wouldn't believe how much research and development goes into creating a coffee mug, but we decided on this prototype to go ambi so it's on both sides. Whether you're a righty or a lefty, you still got the gear tasting logo facing out. And I had a little ND on, on that side too, but anyway, new gear tasting mug. Diner style. Pretty close, so these should be releasing soon. Daniel M on Twitter asks, is there a definitive winner to what's the most effective stipple pattern? I would argue it's probably the one that works for you first and foremost, but um, I wouldn't say there's a definitive winner or a stipple pattern that works the best for everybody. It really is going to be what works for you. So this is an older SIG 225 that I used to carry every day. This is the single stack 9mm that SIG made uh, that couldn't really get. These were made in like 1982. Um, and then the FBI dumped a bunch of them and that was God, probably six or seven years ago or something like that. Um, and they became pretty popular in gun stores. A lot of gun stores carried the 225s and you could buy them for about 400 bucks. But I took the grips off of mine and I stippled it uh, with a um, it's not even a stipple gun. It was basically just a soldering iron at the time. Now they make dedicated you know, stippling tips and everything like that. But this was just with a, a soldering iron, the, you know, the tip that automatically comes on it. But, you know, I found that 
stippling just ate up a bunch of my shirts, so I had appendix carried with this, and I found that my shirt got chewed up a lot faster than just not carrying a stippled gun. So that became the reason why I didn't carry this, and stippling ruined the 225 for me. I couldn't carry it anymore. I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, eventually, I found Glock, and that's how I got onto that. I used to carry a 19 for a while after this, but I just kind of left SIG because of the, the DASA issue. Um, I really like the single action only stuff with the Glock, so I don't, I don't like the double action or the decocker anymore of the SIG. I used to really love it, and I have a lot of reps in, so I can still use the SIG pretty well, but I just, I don't know, I'm just not a fan of of the DASA anymore. I've just found that it's not as, as good as like the 43 that I carry. So um, that's my advice and opinion on stippling. Michael C. from Patreon asks, what are your thoughts on Sordans versus Peltors? Which models would you go with? So the old Sordan versus Peltor debate has been um, long going on and I have just gotten these Peltors in. These are the Comtac 3s, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly. Anyhow, I'll make sure that's in the uh, description just to, to be sure. But So I really have found that not only the gel, the gel cups from these ear seals are superior to the way that I thought that the Sordans were comfort-wise. So these blow the Sordans out of the water comfort-wise. And, you know, I went, in, I went into this in a, pretty extensively through a gear tasting because I had, I had started to use uh, these little adapters from Unity Tactical to, to enable me to remove the head strap from these and to be able to run them like this. Um, however, since I have these and I started using them, I found these to be really beneficial just to leave on a helmet and not mess with and then I still wear my swords from time to time when I'm, I'm at the range but I've also got another pair that are in my truck um, but I just I feel like the the contacts really are a step above the swords in my mind I have I have had to have these repaired before um, I sent these into TCI a long time ago this is when uh, TCI was, I think they got acquired recently, but uh, I don't know. I, anyway, so I have had to have them repaired. That's not a sign that they're, they're garbage or anything, but um, there was an issue with these that I had at one time with the battery. So uh, the battery compartment was not, uh, the batteries were shifting around and not staying on. So that was the issue I had to have fixed. But I've really enjoyed Sordens too. So, you know, one, it's not like one blocks the noise better or cancels the noise better than the other. Um, I think they both function a little bit of the same, uh, the same way. Um, however, I think comfort-wise, I think the, the, the 3M Comtacs have it over the, the Sordans. And I've even, you know, upgraded the, the ear seals, like I said, to the gel cups. Um, but these are like, these are like butter compared to the Sordans, so... That's my, uh, that's my two cents on those. Um, I've still been wearing these contact, these contacts, evaluating them, and I'm still kind of thinking about that uh, in terms of, you know, how that'll come out in the end, but I really feel that at this point, um, I'm pretty sold on contacts being a, a better choice than the Sordans, in my opinion. All right, next question from Tika the Husky. Any new Kickstarters you're backing? I am not currently... Um, however, I was looking back through my Kickstarter when I saw this question come in and I was just kind of taking a look at what project I've backed over the years and I've, I've now backed like something like 30 projects or so and I do it primarily to get new stuff coming in that I'm kind of evaluating for gear tasting and stuff like that. So some of the things you have seen on gear tasting have come originally from Kickstarter campaigns like uh, one that I can think of off the top of my head is the Tough Hook. That was one we did a long time ago on uh, an ITS video, so that's just kind of a way that I kind of keep my ear to the ground of new developments in, I guess, the industry that we're in, uh, in this tactical industry. So um, one thing I wanted to do is eventually what I'll do is I'll look through, back through my list, and I'll go over everything uh, applicable that I've backed, and then we'll kind of take a look at how's it performing now versus, you know, when it was received, has was this made into a full-fledged product? Can you now buy it? Or was it something that fizzled out after the Kickstarter launch? So um, 
I thought that would be a, a cool thing to hit one, one day on gear tasting, so stay tuned for that. Uh, last question comes from Christopher on Twitter. When practicing basic shooting skills and semi-tactical drills at home, what's your preferred method, airsoft or practice ammo? So, I don't know if you own your own house, Christopher, but I know I don't want to go around cleaning up airsoft BBs all over my house, so I probably wouldn't run airsoft through my house just because I would want to get the reps of actually firing at targets and stuff. So I, my wife would probably frown on that too. So it's not just me. Um, she would get pissed if she found BBs in the vacuum cleaner and crap like that. So anyway, um, what I can recommend is a product that I got to try out whenever I was at Telerit Group out east uh, for that night vision operator class. So they have a kind of a, an exclusive with CERT to where they replace the visible laser in a CERT pistol uh, if you're not familiar with CERT, Google that. Uh, we have, there's also a video on ITS that we did reviewing the CERT pistol. That's S-I-R-T. So they take the visible laser and replace it with an infrared laser, and they pair it with a target that gives you an audible and visual feedback whenever it hits. So basically, you can put these targets up around your house and fire the CERT pistol into the target, and you get an audible beep telling you you made a hit and you can keep moving. Uh, but it's a great way to train with the CERT pistol and you know otherwise you get that that visible laser identification of where the round is hitting supposedly um, when you when you fire the CERT pistol so you get the reps of you know your dry fire with the CERT pistol but then you're also getting that visual feedback with the CERT of where the laser is hitting and you know Rob brought up a good point to me one of his friends Brent was is uh, uh, was also saying that he was getting into some bad training scars because he would shoot the certain kind of be looking around for where the laser was hitting visibly, um, you know, to see where he was, where his shots were going, so to speak. So I really like the combination that Telura Group put out of that. It's, it's not cheap. It's, you know, I think it's about right around 500 bucks or so for the set, but you do get the, the single target as well as their customized cert pistol that runs an invisible uh, or IR laser. So, and I, I don't think, I think there's other targets that you can get that interact with an IR laser for audible feedback, or at least you can buy targets like that separately. So you could put multiple targets up and have someone go through your house and put up the targets in different rooms, uh, preferably on a silhouette target or something like that, so that you, know, you could come in, make entry into the room, and get the rep of not knowing where the target was going to be. Um, when you're training like that too. So anyhow, hope that helps. Um, that's really what I need to do too. I need to pull the trigger on that set. I just haven't yet. I know they're back ordered, I think. Um, but anyway, check out Tolera Group. I'll put the link in the description too. So um, I'd really like to not just do cert pistol, but do uh, the set that they have too. So anyhow. As always, thanks for watching Gear Tasting. Use the pound tag Gear Tasting on any social media network. Our pound tag's right there. It's really small on the new mugs. Pound tag Gear Tasting. Any social media network, if you got questions, we will answer them here on the show. If you're enjoying what we're doing here on the show, please consider supporting on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash ITS Tactical. Check out some of the perks we have there and some of the things that we can give you in return for your support. Thanks for watching.